Hello, I'm, my name is Richard Wentworth. I'm an artist and I've come here today to talk to Ivor Bowditch, who, from meeting him once before, I think might be the person who knows most about China clay in the world. Um, I say that with a little bit of humour, but the point, of, uh, the point of talking to Ivor is to find out what he knows, and I'm incredibly curious about the entire subject. And I remember when we spoke once before, you describing how you grew up, and I still feel that that's incredibly important. And that's, it's, did it have something to do with farming? Yes, in fact, um, I'm a Shropshire lad, and we holidayed in Cornwall. And I was always fascinated by the landscape in and around St. Austell. Uh, which was described, and still is to some extent, as a lunar landscape. And uh, China clay uh, generates quite large volumes of waste materials, many of which today are used, for example, sand and gravel. But the tips were cone-shaped, and it gave this impression, particularly from a distance, of being a lunar landscape. Well, I suddenly got a bee in my bonnet that I was going to work for China clays, we were tenant farmers, and sadly my father was killed in a motor accident in the 1950s. So uh, my mother had uh, given up the, the, the tenancy, and um, I started doing all I could school-wise uh, to see whether I could uh, get a job in Cornwall, which really meant that I was looking at uh, tin mining, which started some revival in the mid-60s, and China clay. And uh, I corresponded with English China Clay, who's the world's leading producer of China Clay. And lo and behold, in uh, 1966, I joined. And uh, I did all but uh, one year, um, 50 years, 49 and a half years service in the industry. So I saw many, many changes. And um, it's been a fascinating experience. E even as you... S how old were you on these holidays? I would have been, when we were first coming to Cornwall, around 10. And I joined uh, after O-levels at the age of 17. And uh, English China Clays were going through a massive uh, development, uh, really growing all the time. China Clay, of course, is used in a wide variety of end uses. At that time, paper was the major consumer. But of course, ceramics is something that everyone would recognize, but paints, rubbers, plastics, sealants, adhesives. And I joined when the company was moving from um, one million tons to two million tons to three million tons annual output. And so I found myself almost by chance, because the company were desperate for young supervisors, at the age of 20, managing a shift as a shift supervisor with 51 people in the shift most of whom were old enough to be my father. So it was uh, quite a, an experience. W were you welcomed? Um, I hope I was. I, I would say yes, because uh, all that I was <coughs> able to pass on in later life about the industry and uh, its peculiarities was largely taught by these uh, elder gentlemen, as I thought them to be, uh, but really lads in their 40s and 50s. And um, I listened, and uh, of the 51 that I had in those early days managing a shift, I only had one guy who tried to wrongdo me. And he came to work uh, with uh, too much beer aboard on a night shift. And I went down to, uh, to question him, and I asked him to walk towards me. And I moved left, and I moved right, and I could see he wasn't walking straight, and he fell over. <laughs> what year so, was that? So uh, that would have been in... Uh, 1970. And uh, those experiences uh, really sort of uh, set me up for life because I went on to work not on the production side uh, for the whole of my career, but I spent some time in marketing and uh, human resources and ended up as the communications manager, uh, which was a job I thoroughly enjoyed. I travelled quite widely, but for my love of Cornwall, I say, thank God, I always had a Cornish base. C can you go back almost to me a sort of um, 
uh, ge geological story. I mean, when does China clay... Tell us what China clay is and at what point it starts to become a player. I'm yeah, I mean, China clay in very simple terms is decomposed granite. And uh, granite consists of three minerals, quartz, feldspar, and mica. And it's the feldspar content in the granite which basically is altered and largely due to uh, acidic uh, vapors uh, or um, the presence of water, which can be uh, acidic, and heat. And uh, in Cornwall and Devon, uh, where the granites were uh, at one time under the sea, uh, certain geological uh, features took place uh, which really, I suppose, you would liken to volcanic activity. And uh, radioactive gases were produced, very acidic. And uh, the end result was that the feldspar became softened and, of course, had these extra special properties which were discovered in the 18th century, which allowed the feldspar to be turned into porcelain. And the feldspar, are they the little flecks? In the it would be the, uh, the, the, the white portion of uh, a lump of granite, yeah. the silver greys, the quartz, and the, the darker coloured material, uh, almost black in colour, is the mica. And uh, we, of course, even today, have huge quantities of waste which we have to discard. But I'm you know, very pleased to say that over the last 25 to 30 years, more and more of the sand and gravel are now used in the local construction market. And we even see a weekly train leaving Cornwall uh, to go up to some ready mix plants in the Greater London area. So uh, the the waste of yesteryear is uh, a product of today. Go back into the 18th century, which I always think one has to say the 1700s, but I'm that kind of child. Um, who found what, when, how? Well, the, the person uh, who found clay uh, was himself a chemist, a Plymouth chemist. Uh, he was a Quaker and had Quaker friends living in Cornwall who were involved in uh, mine management, copper and tin mine management. And uh, William Cookworthy, the Plymouth chemist, uh, had come down to see a friend, fellow Quaker, who uh, was in charge of a mine fairly close to... Helston, um, really between Helston and, uh, and Penzance, uh, an area, small area of granite uh, known as Tregoning Hill. And um, he saw that they were using the early steam engines in the, uh, the mines and they were repairing the fireboxes uh, of the engines uh, with clay that was being actually produced almost as a byproduct from tin mining. And uh, he so recognised like the, rec the properties, and the rest is history, as they say. No, the, these fireboxes were on basically raising steam for the steam engines, which were used for pumping and then for winding. So are you describing bricks? I mean, how, what form is the clay? In? Oh, the clay uh, was made in, into a, a brick, like a fire brick. Yes. Uh, but Cookworthy who had certainly uh, done his homework, had seen uh, Chinese porcelain traded through Plymouth, and being a chemist had been able to uh, deduce really what was going on and, and, and how this clay could be fashioned. And uh, he, in fact, took out a patent uh, some years after he made the discovery, which was in 1746. He, he took out a patent in 1768 uh, which basically gave him the right and his partner uh, to produce what he would describe as English porcelain. Now, this infuriated the established potters up in Staffordshire. So you then had such established names as uh, Wedgwood, Spode and Minton all challenging the patent. And it was, in fact, modified in 1775. And that opened up a period of activity when the Staffordshire potters came down to Cornwall and actually operated some clay workings on their own account. So they came on site? They came on site. Yeah. But 
Of course, we didn't have a link uh, really with uh, England, as the Cornish would describe, uh, and, until we, we, we saw the railway. I mean, obviously, you could travel by road, but it was uh, very lengthy travel-wise. But when the, uh, the Royal Albert Bridge was constructed at uh, Saltash and the by Brunel, um, uh, 1859, uh, we then saw <coughs> clay starting to be moved to Stoke-on-Trent by rail, and the Staffordshire potters by this time had uh, really thought of relinquishing their um, operations and left them in the capable hands of Cornish managers. So some of the potters continued to actually own the holdings, uh, but uh, left the day-to-day -day management to local Cornishmen. And uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, there were almost 100 companies. I mean, today there is just um, really one major producer worldwide of China clay, a company called Imris, who eventually took over the company that I joined in uh, the 1960s, a company called English China Clays. Where is Imris? Who is Imris? Well, Imris uh, really were formed in the late 19th century initially as a, a producer of metal, so they were into metal mining and processing. But is that is that in Great worldwide? They they were a French company, French company, and still are um, head offices in Paris. Rather nice if you get a trip over there. Um, but Emiris. <laughs> Uh, recognised uh, ECC were facing uh, some problems. The European uh, Union, my early early uh, days. Uh, in the no no, this is much later. This is in the 1990s, and uh, English China Clays, which had uh, been one of the first companies in the FTSE 100, uh, had lost its way. We we were starting to show some relatively poor financial results, and the the share price slid. And that really opened the door for Emiris uh, to put in a bid and was successful in April uh, 1999 uh, in taking over ECC. And so Early Blair years. Early Blair years, yeah. yeah. Just go back to the, um, the, the porcelain moment. Um, where are the Germans in all of that? Well, the, the Germans uh, again started to use English China clays, although uh, there is evidence that clays uh, are found in, in, in many other countries, uh, not quite on the scale that uh, Cornwall and Devon reached in the uh, late 19th and for most of the 20th century. But the Germans have been using some local clay, as did the French uh, producers. Uh, but the Cornish clays in particular excelled in terms of quality and uh, even today we've come full circle that the, the, the largest market for the clays from Cornwall today is back in the ceramic sector and uh, the, the bulk of the quality paper China clays are now produced by Emiris in either Brazil or the United States. So it's a very global business but, but Cornwall really put uh, China clay, or kaolin as it's also known, from the Chinese connection. Chinese first discovered granite, converted into clay, at a place called Kaoling in Yangtze province, hence the derivation of the term kaolin. And outside of the UK, uh, nearly all China clay deposits are referred to as kaolin deposits. And of course, we've probably all, at times, with a wobbly stomach, had kaolin and morphine. Still a market for clay today. <laughs> I think that dates us. <laughs> <laughs> um, does that mean in, in that uh, globalising sense, does that mean a bit of serve porcelain? Is there a point at which serve porcelain would be made with uh, Cornish? Yes, I, I mean, I, I, I would uh, go as far as to say not just because I've had a, uh, a lifetime involved with the industry, but the Cornish ceramic clays really excel uh, against the, uh, the competition wherever it is. And uh, there are certain subtleties uh, in the, the geology of the clays. I mean, basically, the, the three minerals are the same, quartz, feldspar, mica. Uh, but 
what actually happens in the formation of the clays will materially affect the, uh, the end use and the properties of the clay. And uh, we, you know, as I've already mentioned, produce many you know, thousands of tons now from outside of Cornwall. But ceramic clays, uh, we, we can sell our ceramic clays anywhere in the world and, and, and not find a real match for them. So uh, it all started with ceramics and it's, uh, it's going forward hopefully still with ceramics and all the others. I mean, we still produce quite a considerable tonnage of paper clays uh, from Cornwall, and we still a produce... A paper clay is a, is a glazing clay? Uh, it, it's used as a <coughs> filler, the Cornish clays. So uh, if you take um, a, 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 say, a, a, an ordinary magazine rather than a glossy magazine um, or a, a daily newspaper, it will contain a, a filler which basically fills the gap between the fibre, otherwise it would look like blotting paper. <laughs> um, so the, the, the um, tree-based paper is patched up? Patched up. It, you're, 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 you're putting, uh, as the, uh, the really high-quality clays are described, you're putting a coating or you are filling the gaps uh, in, in the fibre. So the filler basically gives you a, a relatively smooth base and if you then coat the paper you get a really glossy and, and, and the, 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 the glossing clays also tend to be high in whiteness or brightness is the term used in the industry. So if you take the many um, magazines despite uh, the, uh, the information technology revolution still there are plenty of coloured magazines on the shelves uh, the really high gloss ones will contain china clay or another mineral which Imaris also produces and is a world leader, uh, calcium carbonate. So ground marble or chalk or white limestones also have a similar role to play in the manufacturing of paper. I love the idea that somewhere between um, one of these pits and pornography there is a sort of elaborate connection. <laughs> We don't always go to the pornographic links. <laughs> no, but it's a f f strange thing, isn't it? That the, the, wor the, the world of materials that um, everybody lives in, and we've reached in our lifetime, we've gone to a point, I mean, you obviously as a child were unusually curious, and I would say, I don't know whether you know this, but the word ambitious is, is a cousin of amble and ambit it doesn't mean to stick your elbows out and tell everyone else to get out of the way it means to look around something in a considerate way and it's i think that story of you as a child being alerted in some way being curious and it i mean it's an ex very unusual that somebody would have childlike curiosity and it would lead to 50 years <laughs> in a business. Yeah. Um, I think the, uh, the other thing... It's charming. I mean, it's... Uh, I, I'm, you know, <clears throat> very proud of, and uh, my uh, dear Cornish friends, uh, uh, I, I quickly, uh, although uh, I didn't have a particular West Midlands accent, uh, I recognised the, the wonderful Cornish dialect. And uh, if you didn't learn to understand the dialect uh, quickly, uh, you are not going to be particularly well thought of. So uh, by the age of 20, having spent uh, three years then in the industry, uh, I was told, you're one of we now, boy, you're one of we. <laughs> so I, have to translate I, that I, I had, had reached a point where I could understand all the dialect expressions, so they accepted me as a Cornish man, a Cornish cousin, you know, although born actually in Shropshire. And what, is it, what you just said? Just one are we. Well, one, one are we. we. You're one of us. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. And people are very often referred to as party. Now, if someone is down the road complaining about the, uh, the blasting, which we have to do as part of the, the, the quarrying activity, we would say, they party down the road are kicking up some stink again, you. <laughs> So party is... A group uh, of people. A a, and it's a group. Very often, uh, you, you have to be knowledgeable enough to make the connection between which party they're talking about. <laughs> it could be a tea party, or it could be someone complaining about the blasting. 
Well, you've cha- yes, you've changed my... <laughs> I won't hear part of the same way again. <laughs> but what about... I think what what's very striking to me is that there's a... The end product or... Um, let's say the implication in products is all to do with uh, is incredibly as one might say refined so it's to do with smoothness and um, you know even as I'm speaking a kind of fingertip uh, sense of how our lives are conducted think you know you you pick up a, a cup or a drink from a cup and you know at once whether that's something you'd rather not drink from because it's chipped or whatever. So there's a whole lot of sensory things and, and, and particularly, I think, with um, paper and books, trying to turn the newspaper. Yeah. And then at the other end is what where you started talking, this unbelievably... To my mind, I don't think of it as savage, but in the proper sense, it is this assault on the landscape, you know. The and the, a word that I think we don't hear anymore: the winning of the material, the the sheer industrial energy that's implicated, and that, that that's quite a. I mean, I suppose you could say that's in. That is in absolutely the twenty-first century crisis. I mean. If oil didn't come out of the ground, I wouldn't be here because I drove here, etc. So a lot of the work that you've been involved in is not just understanding how those holes are made and how those materials are separated and what happens to the waste, but also uh, convincing people that you're not a bad person <laughs> or it's a good activity or you say a bit more about that because that's that is it seems to me that once the railway was invented that's the the um, well Cornwall of course um, has uh, for hundreds of years attracted tourists and uh, I think that we started to see the environmental changes really in in the 1960s and so when I joined uh, the company English China Clays in uh, 1966, uh, there were already problems looming with regard to criticism of the way the landscape was being treated. And who would those critics be? And they would normally be people who um, had no knowledge of of mining uh, or quarrying, uh, who probably, uh, to a great extent, uh, were very often professional people, um, teaching accountancy, uh, languages, uh, who would come along to Cornwall and see not only a landscape which was very vastly different to anything they would see anywhere else in the country. Um, the nearest would be probably the uh, slag uh, heaps uh, surrounding uh, deep coal mines. Um, ours was so noticeable being white and we also in fact uh, quite legitimately at one time uh, had a a free hand in being able to turn uh, certain residues which were fine in particle size into the rivers so the the river fowl the St Austell River and the Par River all uh, basically having their source within the 25 square miles of clay-bearing granite, uh, those three rivers carried the uh, mica, which there is little value or use for, and they went uh, white over a period of probably 50 years, starting from the the middle of the 19th century. And that continued uh, at a pace, really, throughout the 20th century. So much so that the St. Austell River even to this day, is referred to as the White River. And the new town centre built some 25 years ago in St. Austell is known as White River Place. And uh, English China Clays, who uh, I'm going to sort of sound uh, the uh, 
the trumpet for them and uh, wave the flag because they were always very technologically advanced. Uh, people very often uh, would write off mining as being a fairly crude undertaking, brute force and ignorance. Uh, but China clay required quite a lot of sophistication and ECC really excelled at research and development. And uh, we developed many techniques for refining not only China clay, but many other minerals. And uh, at peak employed uh, 250 people uh, in a central laboratory in St. Austell, which serviced our interests, which started to grow uh, into other minerals as well as China clay. So that laboratory was highly speculative. Highly uh, speculative and also highly influential on us really uh, putting a whole range of new products into the marketplace, into you know markets which at the beginning of the 20th century weren't even known, like uh, plastics as a good example. As a filler for f in plastics? Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, so we, we, we not only had this responsibility uh, to try and make sure we could do the best we could with the raw materials that we were dealing with. But I think that there was a more than a degree of real understanding that uh, the environment was important. Uh, nothing like the, uh, the, the situation we see today where the environment is, is hugely more uh, uh, sort of uh, understandable as an issue for people to be concerned about. But we, we started to look very seriously at the end of the 1960s and uh, again uh, you know from probably <coughs> our own knowledge of using uh, science um, to apply to problems uh, we went to one university in particular who were doing a lot of work uh, with the coal mining industry on uh, reshaping and uh, vegetating coal tips and we worked with Liverpool University and uh, by the early 1970s had formed uh, a specialist landscaping unit and we've been responsible for literally uh, it runs now into thousands of acres of ground have been uh, restored and a lot of the areas in mid cornwall now if you could bring someone back who knew it say 50 years ago they wouldn't recognize what they see today and was that provoked by Aberfan or does uh, that proceed? It, it started before Aberfan but yeah. uh, Aberfan uh, I mean again it, it, it showed the the kindred spirit between uh, those of us who basically were involved in mineral extraction in one form or another and uh, I remember the collection boxes going around uh, the mess rooms or we call them crib huts uh, you have crib in mid Cornwall that's your meal break and you have Kraust in West Cornwall <laughs> just to confuse you but we crib and kraus crib and kraus yeah, but in mid cornwall <laughs> this crib time. time boy and you had a 20 minute break uh, for uh, basically a cup of tea at half past nine and you had a 40 minute break so you had your hour off during the day so you had a 40 minute break for lunch and we we, we had uh, at our <coughs> crib break at the half nine um the uh, the senior captain again a mining term found in both metal mining and china clay the captain brought round uh, a, a, a small tin labeled up for Aberfan, and um, yeah we, we felt it it was a kindred spirit yeah um going because the laboratory or the the thoughtfulness precedes Aberfan, can you just I've got the idea of 250, peop of 250 people of it being a lot of fun because I got this idea that it would be extremely experimental and you would have people being inquisitive. Of, I mean, we're talking about a yeah, huge I mean, complexity. We, what, what we were, <coughs> I think, particularly good at was recognising that uh, we needed to reach out to uh, the areas where we were not necessarily uh, specialist in any particular form but we we recruited people for example from the, um, the the plastics and the rubber industries both products which started to use more china clay as fillers um, we started uh, looking 
uh, at uh, refractories in the greater sense. We'd, we'd produced uh, a, a very uh, highly heated clay where you alter the properties by the actual heat treatment. And uh, so we started to see uh, China clay being used uh, in uh, very advanced engineering uh, technology. For example, Rolls-Royce used one of our products uh, to uh, produce the moulds where turbine blades for jet engines are, are, are cast. And so the moulds are made of China clay, or have yeah, a China clay ha component? have a China clay component. <coughs> so it was this sort of crossover of technology from our own straightforward mineral stroke geological base uh, into uh, areas of uh, engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, and uh, we always said that uh, in the laboratory uh, there was the greatest percentage of uh, sort of degrees and particularly PhDs in probably the whole of the West Country. And uh, that stood uh, ECC in very good stead. Although it's, uh, to me, almost uh, inexplicable as to why we, we, we didn't uh, utilize a little more of all this knowledge uh, to widen our mineral base. Because when the company was eventually taken over in 1999, we were producing half a dozen minerals. And uh, Imeris, the French company taking us over, were already producing uh, over just over 20 minerals themselves, different minerals. And now uh, they're producing almost 50 minerals. And so what do you think? I mean, that's quite... Um, I think it's very... It's rather charming that you would be self-critical in that way. What, what, what is it the French were doing that made them <laughs> more I curious? I think they, 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 they were a, a little more ruthless. Ruthless, and, uh, as opposed to adventurous. Uh, uh, well, both. But I, I think that the, uh, the English China Clays Company, and I can speak uh, obviously for you know, a, a great part of its real development uh, as a company, um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the first in the FTSE 100, uh, and then we drop out of the FTSE 100 in the 1990s. Now, part of the problem, in my uh, you know, humble opinion, was that we had certain senior managers who, in trying to protect Cornwall and Devon, China Clay, uh, almost um, did so uh, at the... Um, peril of, of losing certain markets to other companies and uh, whereas Imeris uh, were a little more I suppose you could say bloody minded and said right we will just expand as long as we make money we will go on and expand and the various uh, fractions of the company will have to compete with each other you know if you're doing the product well and it's acceptable uh, that market will grow if it's not then we don't really want to be there and it was a very different uh, change of attitude. Um, not of all which I think many of us felt was a necessarily good thing for us locally, but from a, a corporate point of view, you, you have to stand back and say it was the right thing to do. You must take the, the broader view uh, because you may protect in the short term, uh, but then undermine in the longer term. And and were you involved in these decisions? Were you able to be? I mean, that's very, for, for somebody of our generation, that sense of um, very considerable uh, industrial power and then various moments arising where uh, cons a kind of conservatism, small c, would mean that something ceased to be as adventurous, which, you know, might have had extremely adventurous origins. A lot of British myths are based on this, you know, where the best tinkerers in the world, but I've heard somebody say, coal fell out of the ground, water ran down hills. It didn't take very long for somebody to notice it made steam. Yeah. <laughs> and we happened to be there. And there were other places in the world where they just happen to be behind that point. So we've got this, you know, very unusual two, three, four hundred year old story of 
invention, buccaneering. I mean, I think the cookworthy description is, is brilliant for a kind of prescience, a kind of inquisitiveness, and, and, then, turning it, and then turning it into something that we would call marketable. Um, but you're describing something which is somehow feels cautious at a period when the, that it must have been known what other people were doing because communications were um, quite good. You could hear someone, some, somebody else's commercial project. You know about it. So I suppose I'm, I'm asking, is the caution that you're describing a loss of nerve or... Um, it's not. It's not a finger pointing question. It's uh, a, I, I think it, it, it's probably. Um, it's almost refusing to believe that someone can do uh, as well, if not better, than you can. And uh, another example: uh, a good friend uh, was our engineering director of a transport division. I mean, English China Clay is uh, eventually after World War Two. Uh, split into to four divisions, um, basically the minerals, China clay being the, the key. Uh, we then had a, a quarrying division producing construction materials, roadstone, concrete, etc. We had a house building division. Uh, one time we got to be the 12th largest house builder in the UK. And we had a services division. Um, now within the services division, although not strictly uh, we, the engineering tended to be under either the quarries or the clay divisions, as they were called. But the, the services really included. We, we began manufacturing uh, on a large scale. We, we employed at peak in the 1970s 1,500 engineers. We had a foundry in St. Austell uh, producing pumps, which are produced today by uh, an international company, uh, on designs which we basically had formulated in the 1960s and 1970s. So almost everything we, we did, we did well, but sometimes commercially were naive, uh, again, my yeah. opinion. Yeah. No, I mean, I th it's very unusual to be able to talk to somebody who understands that arc of... We don't even have very good language for it, but, I mean, at one end is buccaneering, and the other end is thoughtfulness, foresight, prescience. Um, and, and, and eventually, of course, it, it's profoundly political with a, both a small and a big P. Well, I, I guess, come back, I mentioned the, uh, the, the friend who was the engineering director of the transport division. Um, we had a very large fleet. I mean, we, we had depots as far north as Preston in Lancashire and across the whole of the south. Uh, of England uh, with a, a London depot at West Drayton, Middlesex. And uh, we'd bought uh, almost exclusively British trucks, um, names which some people will be familiar with, Leyland, Foden, ERF. Um, and we started having a lot of trouble with the Leyland trucks. What, what year would that be? That would have been uh, in the, um, the late 60s. And uh, the uh, engineering director uh, called British Leyland's uh, commercial director in and said we really are very disappointed with the performance uh, of some of these trucks uh, regularly on long distance. So it was essential, you know, they were running at that time with regular cargoes of clay to paper mills in the southeast, as an example, in Kent and the um, ceramic industry in the uh, North Staffs area. Anyway, uh, the answer from British Leyland was, if you're worried, uh, you know, um, uh, we, there are other models, you know, you, you, you buy a basic truck. And our answer was, well, we have looked, of course, at Volvo and MAN and uh, other continental makes. And the commercial director from Leyland said, oh, oh, you know, I'll, I'll see you when you come back with your tail between your legs. <laughs> this is true. And we almost, in the space of 18 months, uh, moved virtually all the fleet uh, from British uh, manufacture to Continental. And, you know, Volvo, Mercedes, 
MAN, we never had the problems that we had started to see, particularly in the 1960s with, with British Leyland. And there's another example sometimes, I think, of, you know, having pioneered and you couldn't fault the British uh, truck industry at one time and the Continentals learnt a lot from them. But they then went on to deliver and keep delivering the goods and the service in every sense, uh, which uh, a company like British Leyland failed to do. And of course, you know, British Leyland don't make trucks any longer. Foden don't make trucks any longer. They, they've disappeared. It's absolutely amazing for me. It's a purely generational remark, but of course I've heard of British Leyland and, and Foden and all the names. But the fact that I haven't seen any of those names or... I, w I couldn't recommend them to anybody because they don't exist. But also because the way you describe that, I think the thing that's very striking about the way you describe your work is a really unusual feeling of pride, which is a funny word because one end of pride is arrogance and the other end is self-esteem. But the sort of operational bit in the middle is everything that you seem to have experienced inside the company. And what you've just described is exactly when <laughs> pride pride is used the wrong way around. Yes. And becomes uh, arrogance. Uh, arrogant and and it is I think culturally really embarrassing. And of course we are living through a lot of that. Um it's very uh, strange to be reunited with the 50s, the 60s and the 70s when I was a teenager and could name the cars on the road. Sort of thing. It's amazing. Um, um, it's very interesting. I mean, just uh, you know, sitting as we are in my beloved Cornwall, uh, one of the, the most respected names in uh, mining engineering was a company called Holman Brothers from Camborne who employed over 2,000 people. And uh, they had pioneered the advancement of uh, technology in compressors and rock drills. And uh, there wasn't a mining camp anywhere in the world which didn't have uh, a Holman representative or, or, or office. And um, Holman's uh, eventually merged. They, they, they organized the takeover of a company called Broom and Wade who made much smaller compressors, more used on uh, general small civil engineering work compared with the giant compressors used on uh, many of the larger mining schemes. And um, they unfortunately lost their way. And uh, now all the compressors that we have in, uh, in uh, Imeris are either uh, Atlas Copco or Ingersoll Rand. They are foreign names again. And yet here we were in Cornwall with its lengthy, you know, you can almost say 2,000 years of mining history. Uh, the, the Romans came to Cornwall to collect tin. Uh, but this wonderful company grew up in the, um, the 18th and 19th and into the 20th century. And then almost, you know, in the space of 50 years, has completely lost its way. And uh, there's still a, a, a real bitterness in the Red Ruth Camborne area of people who work for Holmans and saw this decline and almost could do nothing about it. And is there a way that you understand that as you move that story from its inventiveness, its pride, its ambition, as you move that up through local politics, politics, Westminster, international money, flows of capital. Is there, do you have a reading of that story as you've witnessed that year on year, decade on decade? Yes, I, I do. I mean, uh, I've met a, you know, a lot of politicians um, through my job in communications, and some I have been impressed with and others I've been very disappointed with. 
uh, on both sides of the uh, political fence as well. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've seen local politicians who um, appear <coughs> at times uh, not to look at the broader picture. And I, I think it's, it's easy in a county like Cornwall um, to always be championing the well, tourist industry, as an example, or the hospitality trade is a word which springs to mind these days. And, uh, you know, you messy old people digging holes in the ground. Uh, wh what do you want to do that for? Um, there is a time and a place for everything, but I, I do feel at times that the, the broader picture is not examined and uh, we do so at our peril. Is there a way of joining that up with... I mean, as an artist, I probably... I would probably always fall on the side of the per uh, the, the side where I would see I would find something in despoliation uh, to admire and I can I'm sufficiently ironic to recognize that by what right do I do that <laughs> I'm not a minor and I've never lived by the daily sale of my labor um, I know how things are made and I can assemble things and make things. But there's something very odd about the tension between uh, the hospitality industry and um, the construction of the idea of the picturesque. So I know people who were coming here in the 60s because they loved the China clay, like you as a child. Yeah. They, they thought this is amazing. They, of course, were. They came in and they went away. They not, weren't living here. They weren't near any of the consequences. But that very odd thing where we, uh, we can be witnesses and consumers at the same time and often not really comprehend what the transaction is. And that, again, happened probably once there were most people had access to a four-wheel vehicle and you saw more and were less, less responsible. But there's a, an incredible tension there between, I suppose, my idea of Cornwall as being, I mean, it's not, I don't use the word picturesque, but it's, um, it, some of the things you've described, the White River, um, do they turn up in, not turn up in poetry and literature and, um, art in ways that where they're actually celebrated for their if you like their corruption <laughs> yes i mean uh, someone who 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 wrote uh, almost with uh, like i say with a forked tongue was a cornish born and bred jack clemo uh, well recognized uh, writer uh, who had uh, his own uh, considerable problems uh, health wise uh, but he when, when was this? Uh, he he died probably about fifteen years ago now, okay. and was born um, very uh, close to here, about three miles from here, near the village of St Stephen. But uh, he uh, was influenced uh, almost in a, in a dark way uh, by clay, uh, which, which he felt overshadowed things. Now. At the uh, opposite end, uh, you would find that people have been inspired by, um, and I, I think it is still fairly unique in Cornwall these days, uh, a real Cornishness, uh, which you wouldn't find certainly in Falmouth or St Ives or Bude. Um, but if you go to the villages uh, which have grown up around the clay industry, like Nanpian or Bugle, St. Stephen, uh, you'll find the dialect still exists, the, uh, the dialect expressions, uh, the uh, sense of uh, being together as a community, uh, hence why we, we, we still have, I think, more than our fair share of brass bands in, in Mid-Cornwall. 
Uh, and of course, we, we've had some great choirs. The Trevisco choir was probably the greatest, but that was a very long time ago when they, they beat the Welsh at their own game at the National Night at Stetford in Langothlan. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very proud. I mean, I have represented the, the, um, the industry, really, because the industry were always supporters of the bands. And uh, I became president of the West of England Band Festival at Bugle uh, some 15 years ago. And it, it's, a, it's a great day out for me. And I have to say, I wasn't a brass band fan to begin with, but I've grown more and more to enjoy it. And uh, the whole spirit of the occasion. And uh, we, we see, you know, bands from literally all over the country competing. Um, Bugle Band Festival has been going now for over 100 years. So there is a, a testament to the fact that it's, uh, it's still appreciated. And uh, long may it be so. It's so funny that you can describe something so there's, as we're speaking, there's voices from other rooms and uh, we are where we are. But the moment you started talking about the bands, um, so there's, there's no, um, we can't hear them, but I immediately felt emotional. And um, uh, that's obviously one of those why culture is so strange because you know it's a four letter word band <laughs> brass <laughs> another five letters um it's very very strong when you um invoke things like that what do the what do the um cornish think of the welsh i was thinking about the 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 i mean mining I think maybe this is a very sort of uh, easy sort of gender joke, but little boys dig holes in gardens. And most little boys have probably done something very stupid where they've buried, probably buried a sister. <laughs> Something's fallen in. Yeah. So the, the whole culture of digging is a very, which I, I'm really interested that when you, disturb the ground so you probably we laughably we might call that gardening um, any anything to do with tilling and that that doesn't take very long before that becomes mining so the relationship of mining to canal making for instance um, and then you've got these people all over these islands who were specialists. I suppose in one sense they end up as the navigators. But is there a way in which the uh, different groups of miners would move around? I mean, Well, the Cornish, of course, were uh, infamous for their, 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 their global movements. And uh, there's an expression which I heard as a teenager, wherever you find a hole in the ground, boy, there'll be a Cornishman there. <laughs> And that's true to a great extent. If not born and bred in Cornwall, uh, probably someone who is trained at the, I think, internationally famous Camborne School of Mines, um, now, of course, part of Exeter University. And uh, I did some of my early training. Uh, I did a diploma in mining uh, on a, on a part-time, and the old sort of, you did, oh, a week here and a week there, but uh, I, I, I attended Campbell School of Mines. And uh, there is a, a, a kinship that uh, people who work in mining uh, have a, a commonality uh, and uh, a liking for each other uh, wherever you, you go to a great extent. And uh, I, I look at the, uh, the, the quarterly journal from the School of Mines, and one is very proud to see these people um, who literally, you know, are now heading up massive organisations which we, we hear about or know about in, in some cases. Um, RTZ would be a good example. Um, Rio Tinto Zinc. Rio Tinto Zinc. <coughs> and uh, I also, of course, witnessed in uh, my f you know, early formative days in the clay industry the, the complete revival of tin mining, which was relatively short-lived. But uh, there was a huge... Uh, amount of 
uh, interest and uh, I think delight in the fact that uh, by the late 60s, you know, we, we'd seen uh, Wheel Jane uh, open as a new mine, Mount Wellington. Um, there, were, there were real hopes that this would go well uh, into, uh, well, certainly the end of the 20th century, and it was short-lived because in the early 80s we had the tin crisis, the tin price slump, and uh, we, we went from over 2,000 people being employed in tin mining uh, to a couple of hundred again. And what provoked both ends of that? Where was the impetus to start tin mining again? The, the impetus was really the global price of tin. Uh, and um, tin uh, is a commodity w which is controlled to some extent by um, external factors uh, and trading organizations. Uh, and there was a demand growing for, for more tin uh, which is used very often in conjunction with many other metals. But the, uh, the bigger mining companies, like I mentioned RTZ, they were one, Consolidated Goldfields was another very well-known name in its yeah. day. Uh, they, they saw an opportunity and there was good money to be made. And I said it went on for well over a decade. And what um, happened in the metal market that that, that would then suddenly uh, There was, in fact, <coughs> a, a degree of stock had been building up uh, and the powers controlling the uh, the metal stops decided it was time to start releasing some of that, otherwise, you know, they would end up with a, a huge surplus. And uh, if there were uh, issues, perhaps international issues, rather like we're facing today, when we hear the problems with America and, and Iran, very sadly, um, it doesn't take long to upset uh, through political man maneuvering, um, the balance of uh, established businesses. And I think that people sitting closer to um, the controls obviously have to make decisions um, you know, based on, on what they truly believe in. Um, but I think that you know, RTZ and Goldfields were certainly uh, of the, um, the mind that uh, there was going to be certainly some years, it turned out to be relatively short-lived, but it was well over a decade, that uh, Cornish miners could earn very good money here in Cornwall again. Incredibly painful experience though, I mean 10 years is... It's, it's nothing, is and, nothing. And, and the investment that which is required uh, on any large mining uh, operation I mean, the most recent, uh, almost, uh, I would suggest, a disaster <coughs> uh, was an Australian company that uh, were looking at uh, the, the mining of a tungsten in Devon at a, a place called Hammerden, just to the south of the, uh, the, the clay workings uh, at Lee Moor, southwestern side of Dartmoor. And uh, when they planned the venture, they knew that the capital requirement would be very high but what they didn't uh, bargain for was the fact that by the time they'd sorted out some issues, mainly on processing, that the, uh, the price of tungsten would fall quite rapidly. And uh, the, the price of a lot of commodities can fluctuate very widely. And uh, the one great thing that you can't always cater for uh, in, in, in any form of risk assessment is the degree of the fluctuation. You know, if it's a steady one, you can ride the storm. Yeah. If it's a dramatic one and you've invested heavily and you've got the bank pressing, uh, then you're in trouble. Um, can we just go back? I'm really... Cu it's quite humbling hearing you do all of this. So I just want to understand something about your family. So how old were you when your dad died? Five. So he was a presence, but he's, yeah. So was your mum a wise woman? Uh, yes, I mean, wise and, uh, you know, uh, a woman has to, as uh, she did, step into uh, man's shoes uh, as such. Uh, we were tenant farmers. Uh, by today's standards, a relatively small acreage. It was uh, 125 now. I guess in the mid-50s that was quite large because yeah. there were lots of holdings, much smaller than 125 acres. And uh, we were, uh, you know, in general farming, so 
uh, I, again, I use the word advisedly, but you dabble in this and dabble in that. Today, you tend to be very big in cereals or dairy, or you specialize. But uh, we, we had, you know, we, we had the, the whole gambit of animals on the farm, pigs, sheep, calves. And was that as a, an economy um, a vivid kitchen table discussion? Um, when we gave up, it, it, it was a practical yeah. discussion. Uh, and uh, my mother uh, was, was quite good, uh, I guess, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a different era, she would have done accountancy or something like that, but uh, she uh, did the books for uh, some of the, the local small businesses. And uh, she, she never um, really, I think, doubted that Cornwall was the, the destination that I was heading for. So uh, when and I there are other children. No, no, uh, she never remarried, and uh, I was <coughs> an only child. Um, but uh, I, I, lucky, I, you know, she she was one of seven, and uh, there were plenty of cousins. And uh, on my father's side of the family, the Bowditch name, which is strange, some people think it's Eastern European, but it's actually a Dorset name, and most of the Bowditches are either in Dorset or East Devon. But my grandfather and his two older brothers had moved to Wales deliberately because land was cheap, and they they bought uh, land in the the Sahawi Valley between Tredega and Blackwood, um, and uh, they actually um, <laughs> they found coal on the farm as well, <laughs> and so I, I, Luck my, my my mother said, "This is where you got your mining streak from," because. Oh, the when you say they found coal on the farm, say a bit they, more. Well, they, they, they were basically uh, farming sheep. And of course, Wales yeah. is very well known for sheep farming. And uh, the sheep, uh, <laughs> it was quite steep land, were digging around. <laughs> and my grandpa told me, <laughs> he'd picked up a Welsh accent, good, you know, granddad found coal right in the side of the valley there. <laughs> and oh, I, I've got on. some... Uh, trade books written uh, in the early uh, 20th century, one in 1910, when Bowditch brothers, the three brothers, were employing 95 people in a drift mine. These weren't shaft mines, yeah. they were just going, going into the into side the of the hill. hill. Yeah. So uh, my grandfather continued in a technical role until his retirement, uh, which was in the, uh, the mid-50s. So uh, I, I suppose I could say that the... Um, the, the, the drive towards holes in the ground started with a grandfather. <laughs> yeah, and you went from black to white. And I went from black to white, yeah. And w th this is really strange. W why would somebody think you had an Eastern European name? It's the itch, I think, because you're in a bow ditch. Oh, how beautiful. <laughs> oh, I love it. I shan't speak to any of my Czech friends the same way again. In fact, I know who I'll tell that. Wow. <laughs> what have we not visited. I mean, it's such a, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm having a kind of attack of, of um, economic history. <laughs> I mean, it's well, an incredible... Well, I, I think going back to China Clay, it, it, it was the fact that the, uh, the whole process was almost uh, overly simple uh, at the front end, at the, the hole in the ground end. Right. Uh, although, again, <coughs> you know, in, in, in my uh, direct experience time, We've gone from what was a big dump truck boy in uh, the mid 60s, carry 15 or even 18 tons. Now the dump trucks carry 75 tons, and they're small by some of the big international metal mine standards, open cast. So you you, you had um, sort of the the crudeness, uh, but uh, based on economies of scale, that has grown very sophisticated now. Uh, something which was very interesting for me, and I, I, I did a, an early uh, certificate before I got my diploma in mining, but I did a blasting shot fire certificate at advanced level. And we had uh, old shot firers who would say, better get out of the way, boy, quick. We would don't know where he's going. I don't want to know where he's going. Well, where the, where the blast would go, you see. Well, that is all very sophisticated now, and uh, you would be in very, very hot uh, water 
uh, if you designed a blast and you didn't know where it was going. But those sort of things have changed. But then in the middle bit, the, the clay refining process became so sophisticated, particularly in the 1960s, uh, with the use of just about every uh, metal processing technique also being incorporated into a much softer mineral, uh, the, the China clay. So uh, we use what the term is comminution, basically a, a whole series of grinding technology uh, to produce uh, different end results, uh, different specifications. We, we use flotation, still widely used uh, in You'll have to mining. describe some of it. What, comminution? Comminution is grinding, uh, <coughs> using a grinding media to take a hard material and basically make something softer. Okay, uh, and are we size. using wheels or No, the, 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 or it, it's what? basically grinding media in the form of um, either high quality silica sand or okay. in some case uh, a refractory, a, a, a clay that has been heated so that it becomes very, very tough. Um, and that's used as a, as a medium? It's a, used as a medium to take something, uh, d the example I, I, w I would give is um, y if you rolled a, a lump of clay into a ball it was slightly wet and then you put it in your hands and you start to rub them together, you'd start to break down that ball into its individual components yeah. again. And that flaking. And, and that's what you're doing, but on a, a fairly, you know, minute scale, because I mean, we, we measure uh, the minerals that we're dealing with mainly in microns, the thousands of a millimetre, so by any standard it's very small. Uh, but uh, that was the sort of technology which the bit in the middle uh, of uh, China clay production was really quite advanced, and uh, it's, it's never lost that advancement. I mean, and Imaris used virtually all of these techniques that we were using in China clay in the much wider range of minerals that they produce today. And uh, because we process the clays in a liquid state, the other end, which was completely different, more like a factory, was we had to dry the product at the end of the process. So. Uh, we developed many uh, stages of filtration <coughs> um, which were advancements on what had been used in industry uh, over a period of almost 200 years. And as I quoted with the pumps, uh, inventions on the back of China clay are now being produced by companies of global uh, reputation and size. Um, who are basically taking something we developed in the late 1960s and 70s and still selling a slightly modified version as things get bigger and better and technology advances with IT in particular. Um, but it, it was an industry which was very sort of almost crude at one end with bigger slices, the biggest slice of technology in the middle and then something where you basically just wanted to get the water out of the clay as quickly as possible and dry it as cheaply as possible. And can you describe uh, describe that for a child, how you get getting the water out of the clay? Well, getting the water out of the clay is that... Uh, Draining In it. the uh, sort of end of the refining stage, uh, the clay would look in a, in, a, in, a, in a glass rather like a tumbler full of milk. Yep. And uh, if you give it a few days to settle, it will go to the consistency of a single cream and it will stay roughly like that. But if you left it for, In suspension. Yeah, for months and months, uh, it would eventually, uh, it would settle and it would become more like clotted cream and you'd have water on the top. But you don't have months and months. No, we don't have months and no, months. So, what, so what is the accelerant? Uh, the accelerant is uh, firstly filtration. So you, 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 you put the clay basically into a chamber um, where the particles of clay uh, will bridge the gap in, in a nylon filter cloth, uh, but the water will pass through. Okay. And so you, you, you take the so you're bulk of the water out by letting the water pass through the filter and retaining the solids. And then because you've still got roughly 25, 30% water left in what is a bit like putty, uh, you normally convert that into small uh, lumps, rather like noodles, yeah. um, through an extruder, 
and okay. put it into a thermal dryer. Um, so you end up literally we, heating. We, we will use that natural gas to dry the clay. Yeah. And where was the natural gas coming from? Uh, piped into Cornwall. It's all, all from Russia. Um, probably, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, gas was uh, I say it was a, uh, certainly a, a, a part of the business which changed on my watch because we didn't start really converting over to gas firing uh, until the. Um, end of the 70s, early 80s, and all the firing before that was with uh, either heavy fuel oil or, or a diesel oil. So, yeah, Well, that's you know, another of those lifetime... It, it's so again, yeah. I, I've seen so many changes. Yeah. Uh, but coal was never used. It was, and wow. in 1955, <laughs> when the industry produced its first million tonnes annually, 70% uh, of the clay in 1955 is dried on coal-fired kilns. And if you go around the St. Austell area, uh, you'll find many examples of the old kilns um, easily picked out by the chimney stack. Yeah. Now, the chimney stack was at obviously the, the smoke discharge end, and at the other end would have been the fireplaces, either two or three. And connecting to the chimney were a series of uh, brick flues covered with a tile. In fact, there's what a tile right behind your chair there. So you, you would have oh my God, yeah. uh, a couple of thousand tiles on the floor and you let the clay go in there at about the consistency of clotted cream, which had already been settling in a tank, right. spread it out, flatten it, and at the fire end it would dry. So, and so you push it yeah, out. Yeah. And you, you had a typical uh, length of the kiln would be 250 feet, and the width would be uh, normally about 16 feet. Men in Wellington boots? Men in Wellington boots. Yeah. And at the kiln and a tool, a fire end, tool uh, they would uh, be shoveling it off at the end of a eight-hour shift, and at the stack end, once a week. Cause it took much longer. It was cool. So a linear, yes, yeah, so yeah. a, a, a so beginning and an end. A beginning and yeah. an end, yeah. The first time I came here, I just thought, I think the first time I came here, the thing that I really got was that this is somehow owned. And by that, I mean it belongs. And there's a sense of belonging. So there are all these different activities in this building. Uh, mostly, I think I've once seen a woman in here, but I think mostly they're men. Can you just tell me what exactly goes on in here? Well, the China Clay History Society, which we call ourselves, is uh, technically part of Will Martin Museum now, the China Clay Museum. And uh, the uh, idea for a China Clay History Society uh, was of a very dear friend who is not in the best of health now, but uh, Derek Giles was our financial who controller. So who I met. He uh, was at the number two spot uh, financially for the English China Clays group. Um, and he recognized that uh, things were changing. Uh, it was in the year that we were taken over, and I think that was the, uh, the, the point that, that he felt it necessary to have some sort of formal protection of the archive material, which English China Clay had largely kept. So that's the end of the last century, 1999? Uh, uh, it was 1999, yeah. yeah. So uh, there were six of us initially, and uh, we sort of formally set up the, um, the agenda as such for a meeting to gather people together in the autumn of 1999. Uh, and we've been running ever since. And uh, we remain at about 250. 250 people? 250 members, oh. of which the <laughs> active participants are probably um, about 20, 25 of us. Uh, now, there would normally be a few more here on a Wednesday, but we're just immediately after Christmas, and I think people are still munching their mince pies and making sure the trees mulched or whatever. But um, yeah, I, I, a lot of us do things you know, quite practically. I mean, I, I give quite a lot of talks to the likes of Rotary Clubs and old Cornwall societies. Um, I've got one or two friends here who uh, will um, 
do specific lecturing in schools. Uh, and the, 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 the range of skills is very wide. I mean, we've got from director level to shop floor and everything in between. And, um, and I sort of detect a kind of um, a word I dislike very much, um, a sort of rather wonderful classlessness about that. Oh, you, mean, absolutely. Who cares what somebody, yeah. they, they, they care, so I mean, they're in. someone who was Mr. to you at work is now Fred, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're all on Christian name terms. We, most of us have had service uh, of 30 years plus. In mine it was 49 years. Uh, very few that would be, no one I can think of, less than 20 years. And uh, a number of us worked in different sections of the company. And uh, my, my job had a crossover into other divisions because when I was looking after communications for English China Clay, <coughs> I would also at times get involved with um, you know, speaking about our house building activities or uh, quarries up in the Midlands where we are a major producer of roadstone, for example, in Leicestershire. Uh, so there's a, w a wide range and some very good practical engineers. I mean, um, a good quarter of our membership uh, would have been involved on the engineering side of English clays. So they are electrical or mechanical specialists. In fact, that's something I've been feeling all the time we've been talking. I was thinking that in the way that um, the word ingenious and, you know, to be an engineer until, I don't know, 1820, 1830 or something, is to be sort of between poetry, art, chemistry, <laughs> you know, everything was in the pot, uh, astronomy maybe, a, a kind of um, valuing of curiosity and, and testing things, um, trying things out. And I think when I came in here this morning, the first thing I thought was that I, I thought I'm, I'm in Southern Europe you know, the, the men are gathering. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, very Istanbul or Italy, Spain, you know, where there's a kind of very definite culture of, of, uh, of a way in which men meet, which as a metropolitan, I mean, as a Londoner who doesn't really understand sport, I don't witness I think it's quite, you'd have to look much harder. This is really striking. My wife said if you had a bar there, it'd be your club, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, that's it it's a club minus bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's maybe a dozen people in the building or there's, there's half a dozen men outside. Tell, tell me who they are. Well, they, they, they are again a very good cross-section. Um, David Bell who uh, was one of the early founder members. Um, he is uh, Dr. David Bell. Uh, he, he, he was a, a physicist who specialized on product development, but uh, halfway through his career um, moved over to um, basically uh, technologically uh, improving the process. So he was very involved with the development of things like I mentioned flotation as a process and grinding, comminution. Uh, yeah. Those were areas where he had a little specialization. Uh, two of my friends are outside uh, were lorry drivers, one a long distance lorry driver regularly uh, carrying clay up to the paper mills in Kent. Um, Fred, who we, we, we met, uh, who came in and was uh, sort of uh, joking about uh, turning us out of our office today. Uh, Fred was actually a contractor, self-employed, and uh, did a lot of work as well for public utilities like the, uh, the Water Board and the uh, British Telecom. Um, another uh, old friend of mine who uh, very relevant to where we are now, he was uh, a charge hand uh, at Blackpool Pit, which is now closed down, probably will reopen again because there's plenty of clay. Um, 
Monty Hooper, who is, is in, in the room working on the computer, and immediately next door to us, Monty was the senior uh, supervisor, or plant superintendent, as they call them, uh, and uh, was m one of my bosses when I was just a trainee. In fact, he's just four years older than me, which says a lot about people very often, as the company was expanding in the, particularly the 60s, were promoted at a quite an early age. And I mentioned at the age of 20, you know, I had 51 people reporting to me. And this was not uncommon at all in those uh, heady days of the 60s. One of the things in, in that description that is really striking is that that, to me, is, um, is almost a services description of um, what it's like to be in the Marine um, or... Um, what little I know of regimental um, amity. And w would it follow that, in fact, in the 50s, there, there would have been a lot of people who'd come out of the services or had done national service or had come from the war? There's something about industrial organisation which, by definition, is not, not dissimilar. You know, you're... Well, a lot of the, the people here uh, did national service. Uh, Having said that, there are some of my friends outside here today who are younger than me. So our average age, I, I guess, uh, across the 250 is probably about 70, 72. Uh, and the youngest would be, uh, um, I think our youngest member is probably about 57 at the present time. Uh, and another image that's perhaps Collects that. So you talked about brass bands. Is that one of the things that's very striking when you come into Cornwall is nonconformism, is seeing again and again these emblems of we believe in this because we don't believe in that, or we do it this way because we don't do it that way. Are, are there threads of that running through still? I mean, they've probably translated somehow. Uh, yeah, yes, there are, um, and there is nothing that uh, riles, uh, I say, a Cornishman. I'm sure it happens to people who equally are very proud of their their uh, their county roots. Uh, but you know, uh, you 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 don't tell a Cornishman what to do. You lead him to what you would like him to do, and. There is a, bit, a subtle difference. <laughs> but if you were lucky enough, as I was, uh, to have uh, been led by the people who know, you then could very often use to your advantage that wonderful, uh, honest base uh, of people who did it. People would say, you know, hurry. You work at work in office, boy, but you can start a bloody pump still, can't you? I said, yeah, I can start any of the pumps still. You know. And it was that sort of difference. And uh, but I was a great believer in uh, in taking very seriously and uh, with gratitude the advice I was given by uh, the, the the older colleagues when I was a, a, a whippersnapper supervisor. And that's a really. Um I think that's an exceptional description. And it's funny that, that um, how few people might know that the Duke in education is lead. So you're exactly the model that you just offered. You lead, lead somebody to something. Um, but because we use long Latin-based words, <laughs> people forget these pleasures. That that's, that's all that school needs to do. I think the word landscape is quite... Uh, pretty contested and I actually heard somebody on a mobile phone recently saying I can't talk now I'm in the countryside <laughs> and of course I had to not laugh but these terms which we have for place uh, and place being productive which often means that in some people's mind that the place is then damaged so we're talking about a landscape which has been you know ferociously visited can you could you say a bit about its reshaping and the 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 values 
that are involved in reshaping it? Yes, I think the, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the company was certainly aware, probably ahead of uh, the, the game, of uh, the increasing pressures that would uh, be coming the way of quarry and mine operators. And because the landscape was so dramatic, uh, uh, as I described it, and known to many people, the lunar landscape, the, the sand tips, which dominated the St. Austell area, were all conical. So you had these white cones literally sitting. I mean, there were dozens of them uh, all over the 25 square miles. Was that a natural batter they came It was to? the natural angle of repose that the sand yeah, would fall wow. at. And uh, when we started looking very seriously at landscaping at the end of the 60s, and uh, with the work we did on uh, the vegetating of landscapes, which was largely with, as mentioned, Liverpool University. Uh, we, we looked at the natural profile of the landscape before we'd been mining. And uh, the 25 square miles was made up of some high moorland, uh, the highest point being Hensbarrow Beacon. And it was a, a beacon point when beacons were used for signaling. And that's just over a thousand feet above sea level. And uh, it was sort of either side of the beacon you, you had these river valleys, and I've mentioned the rivers known as the White Rivers. They were all in valleys. So you then had rolling countryside leading up to the high point uh, on Hensborough Beacon. So the, the landscaping has generally followed one of uh, trying to create a, a more rolling uh, landscape. Initially, the conical tips uh, were basically decapitated. We took the top off them. And we started running the uh, spoil out with conveyors. Uh, all the cone-shaped tips involved inclines, uh, a, a standard railway, with two wagons, one going up loaded, oh, one coming wow. down, counterbalance. Yeah. And uh, you produce very steep angles of uh, well over uh, 30 degrees. And uh, the, the, the way in which we started landscaping, first of all, was to uh, flatten to so the tops of the tip were perfectly flat. And, we and what would, would the diameter of a typical decapitated cone be? Uh, probably somewhere in the order of um, up to 500 feet. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of stuff. And the, the one uh, cone which still remains uh, very visible is just above St. Austell. And uh, uh, th that contains uh, almost uh, a million tons of sand. And you know when you start to think of what a million tons of sand would look like, we'll go and look at that cone. Um, but the, the area has changed dramatically. And I would always say the, the real example to see the, 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 the change is go to the conical tip just above St. Austell, near the village of Penwithick, and then go to the largely landscaped Cologus Downs which itself was one of the early conveyor tips, and that is rolling. I, you would not not recognize it from natural moorland, um, largely inhabited by... It's plausible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I shall be doing uh, a little trip there with a, a friend who is uh, chair of a wildlife conservation group for the Roseland area where I live. and. Uh, I shall take them and show them what it was like, and then we'll go up to Cologus. And uh, it's a very good vantage point to look. You can look down on Dorstal Bay and see Parr and Charlestown, where clay used to be shipped from. Again, sadly, no longer. Clay Every went out of Charlestown? Yes, really? until uh, 1999. But uh, not out of the little cutting, out of the... Yes. No yeah. way. It was carried down is by Is that what the chute is for? That's what the chutes are for. And on a windy day, you certainly knew they were loading clay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a white cloud hanging over you in Charleston. Um, and of course, clay was also shipped out of Pentuan and many other Cornish ports, including Newquay and um, Wadebridge. So is that why Charleston was widened in 1970? I was there yesterday. So yes, I, yeah. So the, the they could get, get a bigger, bigger vessel in. Yeah. The maximum we could ever <coughs> carry in Charlestown was about a thousand tons and that was only with boat design becoming more flexible uh, for manoeuvring uh, but the average throughout its 20th century life 
uh, well, second half of 20th century life. After World War II, would have been about 400 tonnes going in there. But the landscape has, as I say, naturally taken on uh, much more gentle slopes. And wherever vegetation uh, is possible, if it's uh, typical moorland, it will be moorland. Uh, if we can get away with pasture, it'll be pasture. And there's been a huge program of uh, tree planting, um, probably somewhere in the order of uh, 100,000 trees. In a way, one of the things that's come out of talking with you is I realise that there's a a really strong feeling of comings and goings. People who come into Cornwall for whatever reason and leave. All this material that has to be moved. Boats arriving to take stuff away. Boats with crews. Can you say something about the moment where all these people meet these other people? So you've got the Cornishmen and their products. The little ports. Boats coming. Yes, I, I mean, I, I would say it, it could lead to amusements and lead to friction. Uh, but on the whole, um, the, uh, the ports of uh, Foy, uh, Parr and Charlestown uh, all in, enjoyed quite regular uh, visits uh, by many uh, of the crew. So they, they got to know the area and uh, we've even had uh, some uh, marriages which have sprung from those relationships uh, of, of visiting seamen. Um, and we had a period which was quite interesting uh, when uh, a lot of Russian vessels, uh, particularly uh, larger vessels going into Foy, um, they also had a lucrative trade in collecting old cars and some hair-raising experiences of these cars being driven onto the uh, the deck of ships to be deck cargo. <laughs> Are we in the 1990s? Uh, this is in the uh, 1980s. 1980s? Yeah. Uh, but uh, on the whole, I mean, other than, uh, yeah, you know, when, when you're, you're in port, I, I guess you make hay while you can. So uh, the local pubs did well, and occasionally it led to a little bit of friction. But I would say on the whole, there was uh, a very good, uh, relationship between the merchant seamen uh, and the ports and uh, some of the, uh, the the shipping companies uh, you know traded uh, for decades at a time uh, with uh, the the clay companies and of course it all generally consolidated as it has now to just one company Himeris but uh, when I joined the industry in the uh, 1960s there were still a dozen clay companies. I mean, some of them real small uh, tiddlers, as I used to family, describe Family, family firms. Family businesses, yeah, yeah. employing, you know, half a dozen people. Yeah. Whereas ECC employed 6,000 people locally in the 1960s. But, uh, good. Applause. Really a pleasure.